the firms will tell you, well, maybe they won't tell you. They've told me, but them, they probably won't tell everybody. Um, so I just will speak generally that there is a, uh, we're calling it a talent crisis right now because of the same thing that's happening at, in the fast food industry, in the every other possible industry where companies, there's 10 million jobs out there and nobody's taking them, right? Um, the same thing's happening in, in, at the, in the independent claims industry. Um, there are so many more opportunities right now. Anybody that's like, you know, with maybe some exceptions, anybody who's complaining that they're not able to get work or at least get started in something pointing and kind of getting in the direction of work right now is not trying hard enough because the jobs are there. They're 1000% there. And all the firms that I talk to, all the majors, they're like, listen, we're, we're, we're dying for, for more people. In this video, I talked to Caleb McLam, who's a brand new adjuster about what I would do if I were starting over today, starting right now. This is Adjuster TV. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Paysetter Claim Service. Learn more at adjustertv.com slash paysetter. e &O provider Kaplik. Download the free insurance for adjusters guide at cplic.net slash adjuster TV. And by Crawford Catastrophe Services. Join Adjuster TV at the 2022 Crawford & Company CAT Conference the first week of March 2022 in Orlando. There are literally dozens of training classes, including wildfire, flood, and several carrier certifications, among others. Register for the conference right now for early bird pricing. Get full details at crawco.com slash cat and scroll down to the conference link. The full link is in the description where you're watching or listening to this program. Again, Adjuster TV will be attending this conference, so when you sign up, let them know we sent you. I'm here with Caleb McLam, and we are gonna have a little conversation about what, where Caleb is at in his career. And I think in order to kind of direct this, um, basically what, what I'm looking for um, out of this call is, is to um, find out where your sticking points are uh, as far as like in your career, or if there's, you know, some part of the claims process, depending on how, how many, much experience you've got with claims where you're hung up and you're like, man, why this, I feel like this is taking way too long. Um, so we can kind of leave it open to pretty much any topic under those constraints. And I mean, if you want just general career advice, we could certainly do that as well. Um, but what do you, what do you got, Caleb? By the way, yes, great, great seeing you again. I saw you at NACA, sure. uh, I guess that was last week. And uh, it's really cool to meet you in person. Yeah, same to you, man. It was really cool to see you and everyone else there. Have the guy doing the camera on the street running around NACA. That was yeah. hilarious. You know, that was fun. But yeah, yeah it was good to see you. And I did uh, just put together a few questions. And they're more, you know, theory type questions instead of sure. practical because I didn't have too much time. But I was just thinking, you know, in a broad scope, and we can, you know, take as much time on these or go fast. I've got some that are just question answer and then just more theory but you know if, if i thought of one if you could go back to after your first year of adjusting and give yourself just a little bit of overview advice what were your main stick ups and what were the main things you would say hey stop doing that start doing this so that's a great question and i, I would say uh multiple things I would tell myself to do after the first year. I know you could go so far with that in so many directions. Yeah. Well, I mean, with the benefit of, of having as many years of experience as I have, I would say the things that would probably move the needle the most for me in my career and what that would help me get where I was going faster would be number one, uh, slow down a little bit. Cause I got, I got really excited when I first got started, when I recognized that, the more claims I could close, um, the more money I would make, right? As long as the claims were at least of a minimum quality level. Um, I would say to myself, uh, spend a little bit of extra time uh, making sure that the file is super tight and spend, you know, extra time with, with the customer. Um, in the very beginning, um, and this was 1999, 2000, 2001, so it's, it's been a while. I did a little bit of run and gun in the beginning where I would, I'd get assigned a bunch of claims and then I would call and leave a message and say, Hey, I'll be there tomorrow at nine o'clock. Uh, if you have any questions, give me a call. Otherwise that's where I'll be there then. Right. Which is in the gray area <laughs> of making your first contact. Um, I would go back in time and tell myself, 
set an appointment with that person, set an appointment with our contractor, because that claim has l much less of a chance of reopening later. And you have a much better chance of writing everything that could possibly be that you possibly could cover in that claim with the contractor there, get an agreed scope and pricing, which is going to help everybody. And, you know, while it may not be like a sudden um, kind of, you know, reflection in my career over time, I would build sooner once i figured this out pretty early on but 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 it would happen sooner where my relationship building efforts would have been uh, much more productive because i'm the guy that gets an agreed scope of pricing on every one that i can um my claims aren't reopening because it's a metric that they follow right the, the carriers follow this the i firms follow this if your files are always reopening you know, like a large percentage of files reopened for supplements or reinspections or has to be redone or it's got to be, you know, the customer has to be talked back from the ledge. Um, that counts against you, right? So it's that classic um, story you hear where they say, yeah, when you're a beginner, you put five in the bucket and you take five out of the bucket to fix them. So you turn some in and then you pick up the ones you messed up and just keep revolving that door. That's, that's right. what I hear people say. Right. So it's the same five over and over again. Yeah. Um, I would also say that I need would need to to try to have um, a long term um, sort of view instead of saying I'm just I'm a cat adjuster. I only thing I care about is go on going on cat deployments, and then when I'm not on a cat deployment, I'm not doing anything. Right? I'm going to go to the beach. I'm going to go visit my visit friends and family around the country. I'm going to travel. I'm going to do whatever I want to do because I'm making enough money during cat season. That I can afford to do that without working in the off season. I did that for a couple, two, three years at the very, very beginning. And I would say to myself, if I could go back then, I would say, put the brakes on that. You know, you need to be protecting the money that you earn on cat, right? And so, so in other words, you're working during the off season, no matter what it is, if it's waiting tables, tenant bar, uh, if you're getting, you know, doing construction, doing, you know, back then we didn't really have the app based stuff like, you know, Uber Eats or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, those kind of things, you're not going to get rich doing those things, but you can, you can add those to like sort of a basket of things that you do to keep the lights on, pay all your bills, maybe save up enough money to, to cover your bills while you're on cat. And then all your cat pay just goes straight into a savings account. Just, just pile it in there and pile it in there and pile it in there. Personally, I would love to start getting involved in real estate and maybe flipping houses with a partner yeah. or two. I, I used to be in an investors group uh, with a REIT and I never mm -hmm. got to pull the trigger on it, but I was very interested, really studied up on it. And that's something I see in my future is either flipping houses or just getting involved in some kind of stuff for myself yeah. i know several at least three people that retired in their early to mid 40s because they had they had they had done that just exactly what you said they had a couple of two or three or four or half a dozen apartment buildings in mid-sized midwestern cities you know omaha or whatever um and they were slowly building a big portfolio of those kinds of properties you know of yeah. assets that were paying them um so 100% have have a, a view towards the future and you know secondarily on that have a view towards your future as a claims professional right do you want to be you want to just get in and do cat for five years and then go off and do something else completely um or do you want to kind of advance in our in our particular industry and, and there's a whole lot more to our claims industry than just uh, cat property or cat and, and i have questions want to work from home I thought that might get your attention. I'll cut to the chase here and tell you that the IA firm Paysetter Claim Service frequently has work from home opportunities for the field and also for desk work, which let's be honest, really just means work at home in your PJs. Still wanna work in the field though? Paysetter's Evo platform is fully integrated with Hover. It is the best of the app-based claims handling systems out there right now. Technology is moving faster than ever and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. We put together a free guide to maximizing your productivity while working at home in your pajamas, along with a link to apply to this dynamic firm. And you can find both at adjustertv.com slash paysetter. That are directly about what you're getting right. into. These are, these are part of the questions. One, one quick side question sure. I think we can knock out fairly quick. When I was at NACA, um, something I ran into multiple times is they'd say, well, we're a TPA. And I go, oh right. yeah. 
I have no idea what they're talking about. We're a third party administrator right. and their TPA claims. Is there a difference for IAs when you're dealing with a company who does that? Is there, is that negative, positive? Does it matter? Uh, I would, so that's kind of a, that's one of those things. It's like, uh, it's almost it's the difference between an IA firm and a TPA is almost a, almost a difference without a distinction. Right. Um, basically what my understanding is that it's been explained to me is that if you are a TPA, when Acme insurance says, Hey, we got a bunch of claims over, you know, in Lincoln, Nebraska, they will give you all the contact information and the policy information and everything for those insureds. And then the, T the TPA's responsibility is to take it from there. And then they don't Hold give on. that, they don't give that file back to the okay. Acme insurance until the whole thing is completely closed. Replacement cost is, is paid the whole nine yards. So the TPA has um, desk adjusters, file examiners, you know, QA people and so on and so forth. They, all, they take care of the whole claim in house and then they give it back when it's totally done. Right. And How many act, uh, adjusting firms would you say are TPAs? Half, I, I, a little bit? I would say at least that. I, I think okay. most of the major firms have some sort of a TPA functionality um, where they're, some of their clients, they're acting as a TPA and other ones, they're just doing task. Right. So in other okay. words, task is where they, you know, state farm, or whoever, you know, just pick a pick an insurance company. They say, hey, we have 5,000 hail claims in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, go inspect those, write an initial estimate and give them back to us. Yeah, right. that's what it looks like I'll be doing. Uh, most recently, I'll, I'll be with in um, North Carolina NCJUA. Okay. Yeah. And so that's, that's right. you know, you do the report, you hand it back, they make the decision and they move forward. So, okay. Yeah. I just so wanted to task. understand what that meant. Yep. Okay, yep. so another one. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but what, what are pitfalls to watch out for about getting paid and the things that should be red flags for adjusters of, well, we do it this way. That should be a red flag. Right. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get paid as an adjuster. There's hourly, um, there's daily, which is based on an hourly, um, where they say, all right, we're, we're just going to expect that you work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. So this is how much you get paid for that. Whether you work one hour or 17 hours, um, there's time and expense or T and E where you, every single little piece of what you do with a claim is paid kind of based on an, again, on an hourly. So like, so if you get $40 an hour, it took you, you know, 15 minutes to make a phone call. Well, then you would bill on your, your invoice you know, 0.25. As far as the phone. timing of getting paid though, you know, what, right. uh, cause I've heard that's something to watch out for. Cause some people, they don't get paid for right. nine and months I'm or that. whatever. That's, that's what I'm getting on. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. So I, and I would say, you know, fee schedule is the final way that you get paid, which is basically a commission on the gross amount of the claim. So, and as far as like, I, I've heard a lot of stories. I have never had a firm not pay me. Um, some firms, the bigger firms will, um, when you turn an invoice in with a claim that goes straight to that firm, IA firm's payroll and that put, that'll show up on your next paycheck, whether, whether or not they get paid. Cause that invoice goes to also to the carrier. That's who, that's who's going to pay the bill back to the IA firm. Right? So if you were, if you go work for pilot and they're paying you 60%, um, then you, I turn in a claim today and today is the last day to get the, you know, that particular invoice in to get on the next paycheck, then I'll get my 60% on the next paycheck. It might be seven months from now when they get, by the time they get paid by the carrier, but that's how pilot does it. And a lot of the bigger IA firms will do it that way. Um, some firms, and I think they experiment with this and I don't know that they, I, I I know that there's, there's good firms out there that do this. Um, so I don't want to sit here and say that not to work for somebody that does this, um, because it's, it's kind of six on one hand, half dozen on the other, I feel like, but some firms will say, um, we'll do a holdback until that file closes. It passes through. 10% holdbacks a lot. You see that in a lot of contracts. Right. Uh, where they'll give you 45% upfront and then they'll pay you the rest when the file goes through. Um, uh, Again, I've worked for a couple of firms that have paid that way and I've gotten paid for everything. It's just that you're going to get a check, you know, three months later for $3,700 out of the blue, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and it may help help. It's sort of like a forced savings. Um, if I had to pick, 
I wouldn't do a whole back um, because I guess in a way it, it, it says to me, you know, if, if I turn a file in and the file reviewer at the I firm looks at it, they all pretty much have the same process. File reviewer looks at it and gives it the green light and um, you know, it passes QA and goes in, I'm, I should be paid for my inspection right? Me going to the house, me making the phone calls, me doing all this like sort of administrative stuff as well as writing the estimate. Um, and QA and the file review, file review should be check, should be catching any errors. Like I used the wrong price list uh, or uh, some photos are not included. QA should be catching, you know, if I miss damage, right? That's their job. Um, because the, what QA ideally should do is do an audit of your claims and pull out, you know, a half a dozen and go reinspect them, right? And say, hey, listen, you know, you missed all the awnings on the back side of the house. If the firm is going to not pay me until, you know, that, that file pops back up, um, you know, six months from now, and they say, oh, you, your first adjuster forgot the awnings on the back of the house, um, and they're, ba they're, they're not going to pay me based on that, um, I'm not you know, I want to be the best adjuster that I can, but I also understand that I'm part of a team. Um, I think that um, some firms will do this as a way to protect themselves. If say, for example, if, if you buy a roof that you should not have, some carriers will get mad about that. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, and rightfully so probably um, with the understanding, I think that there is there are errors that are made, some roofs that should be paid for, for some reason don't because, you know, the damage is not readily visible. You know, a jet black roof, I mean, if anybody's looked at a jet black roof, you know, it's hard to see hail damage on that. Everybody else is around, you know, every single out of their house is getting a new roof, can't see it. There's nothing I can take a picture of, right? If I didn't pay for that roof, um, and then later, you know, maybe there's, th maybe the I firm and the, the carrier have a contract that says, um, that if we screw it up one way or the other, that it comes out of the, the IA firm's pocket. Well, that's one of the reasons why they do a holdback because they can say, well, you know, you didn't pay for this roof when you should have, or you paid for this roof when you shouldn't have. They took it out of our rear end. I'm taking it out of yours, right? I'm like, we're not going to pay you the rest of this for that. So I don't know. Um, I think that b the big firms that I know of don't generally do that. I, sh I should say that I, I know that Pilot doesn't do that. Um, I don't know. I can't really speak to anybody else, um, but I, that's that's kind of my my feeling on it. You know, with the caveat that I think that in a lot of cases, doing a whole back is probably necessary for a lot of adjusters. And I think once you've been with the fir with a firm for two or three years and you've demonstrated that you can really do really well, you probably can negotiate out of that um, because it's pretty competitive at that level, especially if you're good. So, you know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. Um, so next question, let's see. Okay, so getting back to where you were and heading into looking into the future and having a yeah. plan with it, um, to bring it down to brass tacks of, of you know to apply it to my situation and and what I'm trying to do, um, I've done some auto adjusting when I first got started thanks to Chris Stanley and his IA path, super helpful. I wouldn't be here without him. Um, yeah. Just even working towards anything, and he introduced me to you via email, which was awesome and um was able to take your class but after throwing mud at the wall and you know getting uh different hague certifications and all the licenses and everything pilot gave me a chance and let me do a three month they give me the opportunity to do a three month desk deployment for them so i've done desk for liberty mutual safeco property claims okay we were handling some ida claims and some daily claims at the same time 
And it, it was interesting because I got experience in, you know, interpret the FNOL all the way to write the check with authorization up to like 7,500 or write your denial letter and then send it to your team lead for approval and it's out the door. So, you know, baby full file. So that was right. cool. It was interesting to really learn the process and get on the computer side, but I have zero boots on the ground experience. So where I'm at right now is North Carolina because I met someone at the conference who's going to be letting me do uh, some daily work out in Wilmington. So this is going to be my first exposure to actual daily property claims. And I'll be doing it um, for one of the major carriers here in North Carolina. So knowing my background and where I'm at in my career, what do you think would be a good one-year goal and a good five-year goal? Because I, I can, you know, make stuff up and say, oh, well, I want to be in commercial because that sounds smart. You know, that sounds like the right, right idea. But what what is not even realistic? I'm talking shoot for the moon because I like to shoot for the moon. So what, what's a good one-year goal? What's a good five-year goal uh, for an adjuster? Are you talking like income wise or just like what you should be oh, doing? Oh, no, no. As, as to what you're doing and where you are and the balance of what types of claims you're handling, if you are feeling hungry and you want to progress into more, um, not, I guess, necessarily niche, but things that are intrinsically higher income, but they're also more detail oriented projects that are being done by more advanced people with more with teams that have relationships going and you know, things like that, like large right. cat loss. That's what I think, but I just don't know what's out there. What I want to get excited about what's in the future. What is out sure. there? What are, what's stuff to look at? Well, let me ask you a couple questions. So mm -hmm. how old are you? 29. 29. And then are you single? Or are you married? I'm single and I have a girlfriend. Um, I don't have any kids or anything. And right now I'm fully open to travel. But when I do settle down and have young kids, I would probably either do daily claims or back to desk, but most likely daily, I'd pull off cat for at least a few years. So right now I think is the time to just hit it. So I, I'm feeling cat. Okay. All right. So you want to make hay while the sun shines early on before you've got a lot of responsibilities so are going to be like really nailing you down. I got no um, responsibilities. It's fantastic. <laughs> so I would, this is what I would say. I think for, this is January. I, I would say for a, a one year goal, um, I would say yes to everything. I would try to get as many varied, um, experiences as possible. Um, if you, if there's, you know, we could make a little short list and say, um, you know, you're going to go do some field stuff in North Carolina. Um, if there's opportunities for large loss contents, um, I would get on it. If, if you can get on an ALE unit, I would get on it. If you can get assigned a bunch of condo claims, um, because those are, you know, they can be daunting to, to, to people, especially early in their career because there's a lot of paperwork yeah. and if you mess it up you can you know, i've actually had the opportunity to do all three of those but only from the desk not in person right um and that may be you know that may be enough i would say um you definitely want to say say you know yes to any commercial assignments that you get you know it may be maybe you make it this first year you're just going to be in the field as much as possible right you're going to take you know Put it out there that you're ready to go work hail you're ready to go work wind if there's a hurricane if there's a wildfire if there's a derecho we're getting ready to have a big snowstorm which might dump a bunch of snow and cause ice storm damage way to snow claims frozen pipes um ice dam that kind of thing you know you want to get i don't know if the carolinas are going to get into that but um you want to be uh when does your north carolina assignment start um, sometime this week, I'm, I'm in Asheville okay. right now, waiting to shadow a guy for a day or okay. two, just to, you know, get their headers on my exactimate and see how they do things. Gotcha. And then I'm headed to Wilmington and I'll be starting late in the week, making appointments okay. and I, I can stay really as long as I want. So I'm, I'm going to do a month minimum, but I'm hoping to take this, roll it up in a ball and go straight into Cassie's and into hail. That's yeah. what I hope yeah. happens. Yeah, that's what I would do. And I, and I would take every opportunity to do cleanup if, when it's offered. Let, let your manager know at the very beginning 
uh, or maybe in the first week or two and say, Hey, listen, you know, how am I doing? You know, what can I do to improve my files? You know, how's my volume? How's my cycle time? You know, how my customer service, yada, yada, yada. And if he's like, Oh, you look, everything looks good. You know, you're doing really good. Here's a, sometimes they'll show you the list of adjusters that they have and it'll have your name at the top or your name in the top five or whatever. And then, and then I would say, listen, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hang out for as long as you need me to, to help do cleanup, do supplements, do reinspections, do go get siding samples, whatever it is. Um, I'll, I'm here for you. I'll, I'll hang out just for, for as long as you need me to offer yourself up in that capacity. Um, but yeah, I would say make your first year, um, just all field as much as possible. Um, it's, it, I think in a way it, it can, you know, if, if the weather isn't there, like if it's just, they're just, a, there's a, always a hailstorm somewhere at some point. Um, but if it's a slow year, that may have an effect on how how well this particular plan works. So you have to kind of like work with that. It may be that the first 24 months you try to make like just all field stuff as much as possible. And, and every every loss type that you can. If they say, hey, we got sewer backup in Milwaukee, go for it. You'll I think you'll like sewer backup. Um, for five-year plan, um, I would say that this is where you want to try to niche down a little bit um and really probably by the end of the fifth year you there's probably maybe one maybe maybe three firms that you're always doing work for like maybe you've got somebody that always puts you to work through uh summer you know hail season and then they just drop off and they have nothing until the next april or may um over the winter maybe you go to deploy dailies in southern california for a company like CIS Claims, um, who's they've got a lot of work. I wouldn't there. mind Baja. Yeah, or yeah. I don't know if you can do claims in Mexico, but you could definitely take a break and run down. You the, know what I mean? Run down to time. Cabo. Yeah. Um, but and then that way oh, through the winter, you might, you're going to be sitting in traffic. It went to a picture of you. Oh, there we go. And you back. I hit, I hit the button. So break. yeah, so yeah, exactly. So and again, I, I would no matter what. Um, I would, I would try to adhere to this, the, to the whole idea of, um, protecting your cap pay, right? So you can, you, you can work through the year, all through the winter. You can go to the Northwest and do Liberty Safeco, um, stuff up there for, I mean, you name it, but people, I, I know you can get on with alacrity. We'll have claims up there for that. Um, and they'll keep you for as long as they can get, get their hands on you. But you know, the wintertime in Seattle, Portland, you know, that cor that I-5 corridor up there um, is chilly and rainy, but it's not, I mean, they might get a snow for like two or three days and then it melts off, right? But mm -hmm. so it's not going to be like you're going to be freezing your rear end off like you would if you went to Minnesota or, you know, or Bismarck, North Dakota in January or here in Montana. Uh, it's snowing outside right now. Um, and you can't expect, you cannot look at roofs when there's snow on them, right? Um, so that would be my suggestion. And at the end of the five years, um, you you will have, if you're diligent about it and if you live below your means as, as much as you can and you don't buy a three quarter ton pickup truck for $114,000 and you don't buy a house unless you buy a little bitty one, right? You don't be buying some 3,500 square foot McMansion just because you can, you think you can afford the payment, um, which is what so many people do, um, save that money. And then you could, you know, five years might be a little bit of an optimistic stretch to say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm just going to cash out and go do something else. 10 years. Absolutely. If you could live as far below your means as possible, you could be sitting there with half a million dollars in a 401k or an IRA or whatever, or, you know, a one and a half million dollars worth of real estate in your portfolio is sitting there that you've been slowly, but surely buying, you know, maybe you pay cash for, or you get a little mortgage and then pay those off real fast with the money that you make from this, so that you're always always investing all that cap, that cap pay, you'll be in a really good position. Um, and if you want to stay in insurance, if you know, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. Like I'm a creative person. I, or I always thought I was right. So I, I got a degree in broadcasting, you know, and I, I did TV jobs until I found this, but I like insurance industry. I like the people in it. Um, I think it's one of those, it's a social good. People will certainly argue with me on that. Um, but it's, it's necessary to transfer risk. You buy, you know, you've got a, 
$250,000 house, if it burns to the ground, I don't have $250,000 to rebuild it, right? Yeah. So that's why I have insurance um, for the most part. So the, <laughs> when a homeowner asks you, why, why do we even have insurance anyway? Don't give them that answer. I have heard that <laughs> question multiple times. Over right. The time. Did you know that there is an adjuster school out there that has a full catastrophe property claims deployment simulation that you can sign up for for training. Let's talk about this. Veteran Adjusting School in Sedona, Arizona is just such a school. As a licensed vocational school, Veteran Adjusting School trains you to become a complete insurance adjuster. When you graduate from the Voss trained insurance adjuster program, you are ready to begin your exciting new career, whether as a daily adjuster or as a cat adjuster. Listen, there are many outstanding adjuster schools out there and you've got to get trained somewhere. Voss stands out among its peers for the depth and breadth of its program, which is a six week catastrophe deployment simulation complete with claims assignments, insured interactions, real damage that you can scope, as well as its continuing support and mentorship long after graduates become working adjusters, all of which provide a significant advantage to you. I mean, there's truly nothing else like it. Go to adjustertv.com slash VAS now and chat with an enrollment specialist who will answer all of your questions and help you decide if VAS is the right choice for you. Again, go to adjustertv.com slash VAS. So there are so many places that you can go in claims, right? So it, as you're going along, if you, if you in, invest back in yourself and say, you know, in the, in that first five years, you know, you're, you're going to just like, just pound away at the field, take as many different kinds of like field deployments as possible, try to do this, a, a lot of total loss, total loss fire stuff. Um, and go get your AIC, go get your CPCU, um, maybe go get your MBA, right? So, let me, let me some, write these down because I was going to ask you about professional designations. What would those be one more time? So an AIC is an associate in claims. You can, and if you go to the institutes.org, uh, I think it's .org. Um, they're, used to the, they're, they're the kind of the outfit that has those professional designations. Um, CPCU is kind of like the the MBA for insurance people. Okay. The, yeah, the institutes.org. Um, so there's a AINS, which I can't remember what that one stands for. But if, if you, if, when you get on LinkedIn and you look at these people that are like operations directors, vice president of, you know, whatever, or, or CEO of IA firms, they'll have alphabet suit behind their name with all these different things. Um, and when Would you, you go shoot when you, for any of those in the first five years, or is that more of a, I'm a lifer type, I, I want to have my own firm type thing. Why would you get that? What do they do? For you? So you, at some point you're going to want to probably retire from the field. Right. And there are a lot of opportunities for, you know, upper middle management to executive level roles at these companies. And they're always looking for people to bring in, to help, you know, I'm talking about IA firms to help them, because it's it's a small community and it's extremely competitive, right? So these firms are always competing against each other for clients, for adjusters, and for talent to be in their leadership, you know, their leadership parts of their companies. Um, if you want to do that, um, those salary, I mean, I can't tell you what they make. I don't, cause I don't know, but I know that there's enough incentive there for people who were in claims for 25 years or 15 years or 10 years um, to transition over into a leadership role at an IA firm. And you're going to want to have at least a, a small handful of the professional designations. I would say the CPCU is probably the big boy and an associate in claims. And it may be, and you have to look on the institutes.org, it could be that a, a, an AIC is part of CPCU, right? So you, you would only just need to get the CPCU or, you know. Okay. Um, but I see, again, if you go on LinkedIn and you look at anybody who's like a, a CEO of a, a yeah. firm, you're going to see that. Um, but I would I would definitely do that and try to get as much training as possible. Um, you know, it just occurred to me that you could try to go down the flood route, but I think that... Um, Flood. That was another whole question I was going to have was, it seems like its own world. What's going on? Do people yeah. do it a lot? How many, how many, how, what percentage of adjusters do flood? Is it really small? Well, I can tell you my experience with flood. And, you know, if I would say if somebody is like a big flood nerd and they've been doing it for a while, they can jump into the comments or shoot me an email or whatever. Correct me if I'm 
kind of getting out of my you know own realm but i did some flood on like a i can't remember what they called it, it was like a fast track flood thing on a hurricane on hurricane ike in uh 2000 i think it was 2008 in houston All right so houston floods when a funny cloud flies over the city um so they get a hurricane in there and the storm surge and then all the the storm rains you know water's shooting up into the air they just gave you like a, a one day or like even it was like even an afternoon worth of training and then they just sent you out in the field and if you had questions the bring your file into the office and they'll help you with it kind of deal. Um, my understanding is, is that the flood community is pretty small, right? So there's not always a flood, you know, catastrophe wise, like there's wind, like there's always a windstorm, you know, at the minimum there's wind and hail, you know, starting March, April, May and running through the end of summer. Um, there's not always a river that, that goes over its banks. There's not always a hurricane that comes in with a bunch of storm surge, you know, in a flood zone, right? So you have to, you have to have the flood itself and then it has to be in an, hit an area where people actually have flood coverage, right? Cause you can yeah. only get flood. You're going to be part of the program. If you're actually in a community that participates and you're in a, it's a whole, it's, it's the government. So it's all, it's complicated. Um, so it's, it's my understanding is, is that when there are things, there's a little small sort of like, you know, cadre of people that will go and run flood claims. And they're the one they, they, they're the ones that stay busy most of the year doing flood. Flood's extremely lucrative because the files are, you know, a lot of times they're, they're pegged to the limit and you're getting fee bill, right? A fee schedule on them. So, um, the average fee bills can be pretty high. I've heard of flood adjusters making on hurricanes, you know, mid six figures, like in a relatively short period of time. Um, which, you know, again, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to speak out of turn and say, don't go after it because it's, it might be hard to get into. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, it's one of those things that if, if you, if you go all in on it and you're like, I'm, I'm going to be a flood guy, 100 percent you can claw your way into i mean you can claw your way into any of these little niche areas as long as you're all in and you're the guy that's always showing up you're you're in the back of the room sweeping the you know while you know waiting to get kind of deployed or whatever um there's always a way to get into these things you know so okay. that that's kind of what i my thoughts on flood um and again i, I don't think that it's necessarily more comp complex as as like a regular water claim where there, where you have coverage, um, you just have more limits of things that you can pay for. So maybe that they, they could be a little bit easier. I think the process is a little bit more slightly more complicated because the government has some requirements about a preliminary report and other things. Um, but yeah, so those are my kind of my thoughts on flood. It's a little bit like a friend of mine was a drummer, played a, he was a percussionist, played drums, and he lived in Nashville, went to school, like, to be a, like a professional percussionist and wanted to become a session player in Nashville. And he tried and tried and tried and tried and he got a few gigs here and there, but started to realize that he was seeing the same like dozen or two dozen people on every single like gig or like session that he was going to go play. And they're all gray beard dudes. Right. And so he recognized that somebody had to die <laughs> in Nashville before he could slide in. And there was a long, you know, waiting list behind that guy that he was at the, towards the tail end of. So it could be like that with flood. That's kind of how I've, I've thought about it. And again, if somebody wants to jump into the comments and correct me on that, um, please do. So. All right. All right. Um, another direction we could go in. Um, when I was on dusk, it was something that does not, go towards my natural strengths sitting in front of a computer like this you know right. for a long time every day it's something i can do but it's not something i naturally enjoy i'm an outdoors person so i started feeling burnout i started feeling that you know oh about month two starting into the second half of the month getting towards the third month i was starting to feel it just starting to feel that you know right. depressing feeling of man i'm just i just want the sunlight you know but right. not even just particularly towards that, but just in general and looking into what I'm going to be doing in field, would you have any suggestions for burnout and self-care for adjusters? Yeah. You know, I, I got a couple of emails on this recently. Somebody was telling me that they're, it, it'll happen to you when you're in the field, um, you know, because it's, 
the reason why I think it you, you get that burnout is because it starts to be like Groundhog Day. Like every single day you wake up and it's the exact same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And whether you're sitting inside, um, which sounds nice at first, you're like, oh yeah, I can just put my PJs on and just, you know, sit here on my laptop and maybe make a couple phone calls here and there. Might be, you know, maybe take longer to hit the burnout point. Um, or you're in the field um, where it's hot, you know, maybe you're in Dallas in August and July, um, you're gonna get, the sun saps your your energy, you know, you'll be trying to walk up a slope and it's, you're just tired and it's like, you've, you've got this, the 50th contractor, you know, well, what about this? And he's pointing at bird poop and it's like, you just, you're done, right? These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjusterpro right now this is one of the main reasons why at least on the field side i would write everything up on site at the house right so and i know people i get pushback on this because people don't believe that it's real or that i could do it or i could be effective or close as many claims as i claim to to have closed um but when i i worked so hard and this is i think this is probably part of what how in the very beginning um, when I was running and gunning and going super fast that I developed some of the, the chops to be able to close claims quickly, to be able to move through Xactimate really fast, to have the most efficient way that I move around a building, over a building, through a building, you know, the, you know, the, the things that I'm going to talk to the insured about, I'm going to, there's like, there's a, a, bit, a little bit of a conventional wisdom out there that you got to spend a lot of time with the homeowner in order to develop rapport and to get a good customer service rating. I agree to a certain point. I think there's a point of diminishing returns and it's a lot earlier than the 35 minutes that they're saying, you know, 40 minutes or whatever to spend with the homeowner. I think you can do it in 10 or 15, right? Um, so every little thing that I would do would be like, not that I'm doing it faster, I'm just taking less time to do it, right? So there's efficiency. Um, so this, that's part of the work that, that I did for myself to limit burnout as much as possible. So I could, I would go on de deployments and be in the field on at the same place from, uh, April 15th until Halloween, right. And the snow starts to fly and they're like, all right, well, we're going to close this thing down or, you know, we're all done. Thanks, Matt. Get out of here. Right. So I've spent the whole summer in one place. Um, I'm working every single day until you get to a point, and this is, so I, it's hard for me to like, kind of talk about like de modern deployments because I, I'm, I hear people say, well, no deployment these days lasts more than two weeks, um, which may or may not be true in, for most people, right? But when I was first starting, it, it was two week deployments were common for most people even back then, right? I mean, I, I had a circumstance where on my, I want to say it's my third or third or fourth storm where I had just gotten assigned 27 claims and I went out in the morning to jump in my truck and go work. And there was four pickup trucks and the guys were loading up saying, all right, I guess we're out of here. I guess this one's done. We wrapped it up and it's over. 
I was like, oh yeah, I guess so. I'm just gonna, you know, I'll bye. You know, see you guys. Good to meet you. Right. So um when I cl close claims on site, that means that I get, especially if I meet with a contractor, got an agreed scope and pricing, the estimates done. The homeowner is, I don't have any uh, many more phone calls with the homeowner, right? If you don't close on site, if you scope and then write at night or write the next day or two days later or whatever, you still have to call the homeowner back and say, hey, just got your estimate done, blah, 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 and have them go, you know, oh, well, I forgot to tell you about the water spot on the ceiling, you know, or whatever, which I might have gotten when I was there, right? Or my contractor said that's wrong, right? Then you got back and forth, write it on site with the contractor, make sure that every single possible thing that you could think of is, is covered into the estimate. You know, what about inside? Um, then at the end of the day, I go back to my hotel room and have some dinner and then, you know, watch the game or Netflix or whatever, and then go to bed, right? I'm that done. That sounds doable. Yeah, I because so, you always hear the 2 a.m. You're going to be there till 2 yeah. a.m., kids. You're going to be dying. <laughs> in the beginning, you will be, right? And I was, like my very first first storm in particular, it was, you know, I got 2.30 a.m. until 5 a.m. when my manager was calling me, yelling and screaming about me to get my, you know, to, we had paper files back then, so they we had to have like these barcoded scan things for your inspected claims and your... It was a whole big thing. So three or four hours of sleep a night for you're not going to last a, you're barely a week, right? Before you're like getting an eye twitch and yeah. you're cranky and you're flipping people off in traffic and stuff. So if you get a good night's sleep, um, I think that goes a long way. If, if you structure, so, so kind of like if, if you're going to end up on a storm for longer than two weeks, which I still think is a thing for people who do this right. Right. I mean, um, it may not be a comparison, but for auto hail, I was there 31 days straight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's, a, so then you probably know, like you'll get like a huge pile of claims the, at the very beginning and you might be working for like 14, 18 days in a row, Sundays, yep. you know, Sunday morning, if they'll let you come over to the house, um, you're working every single day. Right. Um, and then you're going to come to a point where the volume starts to slack off. There'll be spikes because yeah. people will leave and they'll take their claims away and give them to you. Um, it it kind of went down, 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 down. And then it seems like we could tell this is the last week, but they're not telling us because we're getting yeah. slammed. And then it's okay. We're done. Yeah, yep. guys. Yep. So we would have something we called riding the wave where you get to the point where, you know, um, you don't get any claims Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but then over the weekend, you know, it's, it's like late July, early August and people are having cookouts and, and, and all the neighbors come over and the guys, one of the guys says, Hey, I'm getting a new roof. My adjuster was just here. And everybody's like, what? Oh, I should file a claim. And then Monday you get 15 claims, right? Well, you can, if, if you've been working in the area, you know, the contractors, you know, you can get those, those 15 claims on Monday and you may be done with everything you had before by the end of the day on Friday, you took the weekend off because you didn't just, there's just nothing to do. You're done with everything. Monday morning, you get 15 claims by lunch. You've scheduled all those 15 claims over the next day, you know, two and a half days. And you go look at three that afternoon. And then maybe Tuesday you get five, right? And then you're able to finish those up by you know Thursday and you didn't get any new claims, um, then you're taking Friday off, right? So you, it's, it's if you're efficient about it and you can keep like, instead of saying, well, I'm only getting like 15 claims a week now, I'm just going to do two a day. If you try, if you hammer those out, you can build days off in there and you could say, you know, you did it. If you wanted to, you could you could you know offer to your manager say, hey, listen, you know I had I do have a two story ladder. Um, I know the volume's kind of lower right now, but if anybody needs help, you know, get on a two story. Um, Thursday, Friday, I'm wide open. I can go help or go look at it and scope it for somebody and take pictures and then email them to them or whatever it is. Um, yeah. Or they may say, you know, it's getting too slow. Get out of here. But they'll probably keep you around I'm to sorry. do. Uh, They'll probably keep you around to, to do cleanup at that point where you're, where you're doing reinspections and cleaning up other people's, you know, not great work. Say you're still in the thick of it at the beginning of the storm, you know, seven days a week. What would be any tips on self-care, things that you know that have made a big difference for you besides being prepared and writing on site eventually when you can and creating windows of time? What's really um, important to keep your sanity? 
Uh, yeah, I would say the time management piece, because more than anything, like, like having every like every thing that you're gonna do in in the overall claims process has room in your schedule. Even if it's like if you're brand new and you've never been in the field or you've never handled claims before, in your schedule every single day is room to learn to, is to is to climb up that learning curve, right? So, and what I mean by that is is like. Um, first thing in the morning, you know, if you're able to go to sleep at a reasonable hour and get a, a solid eight hours of sleep and you can get up at four 30 or five 30, or maybe even six 30, um, you've got some time in there, you know, one, two or three hours where you can do corrections. Right. Um, so, but nobody's, you're not calling people at five 30 in the morning. You know, some people will be like, yeah, call me anytime. 8, 8 AM to 8 PM is my window for calling people. Um, and even 8 a.m. might be too early for some people. So, and then you're in the field for a little bit, right? So you've got one, two or three inspections in the morning. And then I'm going to take a block over lunch, maybe 45 minutes to 90 minutes, depending on how, how much volume I have. And I'm going to, because people are going to be calling, right? So I'm not, if I'm on a roof, I'll kind of back up a step. If I'm on a roof or writing an estimate or talking to a homeowner and my phone rings, I'm not answering it. It's going to voicemail. That's again, that's a little bit controversial because some people will say, you know, for every person that you send a voicemail, you're adding an hour's worth of work to your week or something like that, which may or may not be true. But I think if I built in the way I do it, I build in time in the middle of the day just to go back through, listen to my voicemail, write it down on a piece of paper and call those people back. And as soon as I'm done calling all those people back, you know, if I needed to call them back, then I jump into Xactimate and update the file. And then I'm out the door back on, on my next uh, rough appointment. Or, you know, I remember that from your, from your course that I took, uh, task yeah. switching, how task switching really, you know, messes your efficiency. Yeah. So if you can really get them cheaper yeah. by the dozen, basically, if you can just hone in, go through one task as much as you can. Exactly. So, I, so to sort of back off to maybe like a 50,000 foot view on this, instead of like the exactly what I do tactical level. Um, there's going to be a million things that come at you, you know, and speaking generally to anybody who's watching this, who's never done like, like a hurricane deployment um, or a major field deployment where they're just, I mean, your, your phone's ringing. Everybody wants you at the house yesterday. Right. And they, they're demanding it because why, by gosh, I pay my premiums and I'm a, you know, gold star, whatever. Right. Everybody's the same, whether their claim is super small or the house is gone. doesn't matter. Um, so you have to be aware of all the things that are going to happen and create those little time blocks where you can, this is only this time block, this 90 minutes is only for answering voicemails and calling people back. Right. And then putting that in exact to It's like an admin time block. This time block, I'm only doing, you know, inspections. If I can't write them on site, I'm just doing inspections. I'm not answering my phone. Because the second you answer your phone, you know, especially if you're up on a roof, you're climbing down, you're getting going back to your truck, you're booting up your laptop, you're pulling that guy's file up, and that's you're in the middle of an inspection. So how do you expect to get the, that that inspection done? And then you got to go back once you're done with that guy, figure out where you were, where you left off, where you are in your photos, you yeah. know. So and it seems like even if you just pick up and say, "Hey, I'm going to call you right back," now you put yourself on the hook. Now you got to call them right back as soon as you leave. And what happens when you forget? You know the the yep. twentieth times that happens. So so you, know. you think of your think of your voicemail as like a personal assistant, and you can have a personal assistant, right? You can hire somebody just to do the phone, which I've done a lot, and that's, and I think that's probably. People talk about teams and stuff. I think that that's probably where you get, it moves the needle the most. But use your voicemail as, as a personal assistant and make your voicemail message instead of the generic thing that they tell you to do. You know, you want to be, have it be professional and, um, but you want it to, to, to give people uh, only the, the amount of information that they need to give you back in order for you to be able to move forward with them. So in other words, if you're like asking for their address and their claim number and their policy number and all this stuff in the voicemail, like telling them in your greeting to do this stuff, all you really, really need is their name because I could, it's much faster for me to look somebody up by their name and exact to me than it is by their the claim number. 1000%. I'm never, I'm never referring to anybody's file by the claim number unless it's in an email to my manager or something. I'm going to say, leave me your name. Uh, you know, you've reached the voicemail of Matthew Allen. Um, I'm in the field today and, uh, 
please leave me your name and telephone number and a brief a brief message you know explaining uh what you, what you need you know whatever how, whatever you want to say however you want to say that and i will call you back uh within the next 12 hours or by the end of business today, or within, you know, you, technically you, you, you've got 24 hours. Um, this is an opportunity to under promise and over deliver, right? So if you say, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll call you within the next 12, 12 hours. Um, and then you call them back, you know, it, it's 1030 in the morning, they left you a message at 1030 and you know that you're going to be on your, um, you know, your, your admin time block at, one, well, you've beat that 12 hours by two, you know, yeah. whatever it is, 10 hours. I like um, the whole, uh, no, no requesting the claim number. Cause that's, you know, nobody knows their claim number. They got to go look it up. Every oh, time. I got to go look that up. And then they might hang up, you know, cause they don't know the claim number or they're not going to, or half of half people, half the people won't put it in there anyway. Cause they just don't know it. Um, yeah. but you, you just want to keep it as simple as possible. Um, you don't have to give them your email address and give them a whole big long thing. And, you know, uh, so you, you can wouldn't even exchange say, emails with, uh, you wouldn't exchange email gonna, addresses with people usually. You're going to get e email addresses from your insurance when you, when you, these days in particular, you're going to get that when you make your first contact, what's the best cell phone number I can get, get in touch with you at? What's the best email address I can touch base with you at? Am I, can I text you? You know, it may be that they, you know, a lot of times with these voicemails, people will call like you called on Monday cause you just got to sign their claim. And you left him a message and you said, Hey, you know, Mr. Smith, um, I'm Matt, you know, or I'm Caleb, your adjuster. And, um, just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be in your neighborhood tomorrow, July 15th at two o'clock in the afternoon to take a look at the house. Um, please call me and let me know if that works for you. Right. To confirm that, um, that, you know, not to go into, if you took my course, so you know, kind of what to do at that point. Um, but that guy, he might call back or send you a text and say, Hey, two o'clock tomorrow is great. Right. No need to call me back. Right. If, if, if I'm on a roof and I answer the phone, he might decide he wants to ask me 15 questions. Right. Mm. Which I can get, I can answer when I'm at the house. Cause he doesn't know um, the next time he's going to talk to you. You know, everyone's desperate for the attention yes, on their claim. Exactly. Yeah. I would be, I know I would be when I get someone in person, I'm like, well, hey, I got you on the robot. phone. Here's my, here's all of it. That's what I'm doing yeah. to you right now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, these are great questions. All right, what else you got? I appreciate it. Um, that is all my great questions. The only last one, uh, it, I would just start going into stuff off the top of my head, but the last one is pitfalls you see for one to three year adjusters who've already had their first storm, but they're one to three year adjusters. And we've covered several, you know, money pitfalls, scheduling pitfalls, but ones that you see where it's so easy, but they can't see the trees for the forest. You know, they're kind of, they're kind of missing it. A lot of new adjusters. Um, yeah, I would say probably the, the, the self-care thing for sure, because the, the, you know, if, if you learn how to manage your time and you, and there's a place for everything to happen, you know, the things that seem like, you know, you, you threw 50, you know, plates up in the air and you're going to try and juggle them all or catch them on sticks or whatever. If you, if you know mostly what those 50 are, and then you have a little bit of room for the 50 or the, you know, the 15 that you don't know about, you've got room in there, for some flexibility in your schedule to handle those things. Then you'll be able to get some sleep at night. Even if you, if it's, you know, six to seven hours or, you know, whatever, like some nights, maybe you don't get as much sleep. Um, having being able to manage your time in a systematic way um is probably the, the biggest thing the biggest yeah. the biggest pitfall that that spins people out is not knowing all the plates come crashing down and it's a big gigantic broken mess all around them and then they get kicked off the storm they get their claims taken away it's seen it a 10 million times um so getting sleep being able to manage your time um protecting the money that you make don't don't spend a bunch of money um, on frivolous stuff or things, things, you know, people will do this. I did it. <laughs> things that I always was like, Oh, well, you know, I deserve, I'm entitled to have that nice pickup truck. And so I buy a nice pickup truck, right? It's expensive. turns out it's a piece of junk cause it's a Ford. Um, which, you know, <laughs> if, if you're a Ford person, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> um, I could go into the whole thing about that. Those, those pick, I had two Ford F three fifties and both of them were complete garbage. Wrong year. What year though. Let's not even get into it, but what years? It was 03 and 05. 
I can tell you why they did that then. Though. I know. Yeah. Believe me, I know because <laughs> yeah. I had them in the shop. The turbos yeah. were out, the injectors were, I mean, it's one thing right after the other, not even 10,000 miles on. The thing about it is, is that it shouldn't have to say, well, what year was it? Like, mm -hmm. you know, if it was a 99, it would be fine. Um, but no, it's, they should have good quality. We're not even going to go into that. Yeah, let's not because we could so, go down the rabbit hole for sure. I mean, for um, me, it's a Ferrari 360 Modena. I've always, I've always just had a soft spot for that car. I've always thought it sounds cool. I tell you what, they, uh, I like the way Dave Ramsey kind of frames this. He says, if you have everything's paid off and you have at least a million dollars net worth, take cash and go down and buy yourself a nice car. You know, if you want a Ferrari and you want to take 250 down to the, the guy, you know, maybe have a little bit more than a million net worth, but that's when, that's when you've earned it. That's when you're entitled yeah. to it, right? It's not when you get your first storm and maybe your first storm was Hurricane Irma and you made a thousand dollars per claim on those tile roof claims that they all, those guys got and you made a hundred thousand dollars in a month. Um, they'll be going buying a new pickup truck, you know, go take the car that you have. If it's still got some value, maybe get the, you know, the rack and pinion replaced, replace the radiator, do the water pump and all yeah. that stuff. Man, you know, I have the suspension like that. I want to pay mine off and get off. the dents taken out. That's all I want to do. Yeah. Yep. Maybe paint it, right? Take $15,000 and fix up your car. Instead of, you know, pay it off, fix it up a little bit instead of instead of getting a seven or 800 or $1,100 a month car payment. Sound system. That's what um, I'm looking for. That'd be a good right. thing, but yeah. They have such good sound systems now. Plus, you know, I'm probably wearing headphones anyway. Um, okay. So, so other pitfalls, you know, aside from like money management and time management, um, just, I would say uh, have uh, uh, adjusters need to have their eye on the kind of the big picture. And a lot of times it's, it's hard to know what the big picture is, which is why networking I think is absolutely critical. And it's something I didn't really do. They kept me so busy. I was like, I don't need to go to these networking things. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go to NACA. I'm not going to do yeah. any conferences or whatever. Um, but I think that that was a mistake. Um, and that would, if I could go back and give myself another piece of advice, it would be network as much as possible. Go to all the things, you know, the pizza, sometimes they'll have a little pizza dinner, pizza party thing at the hotel where all the adjusters are there. Don't skip those things. I, I went to an event at NACA and actually randomly two of the people on my team, um, they knew you, but one of them was my underwriter at Kaplik. How, how, like I've emailed this woman and we've gone back yeah. and forth. I'm like, what? That's you. I'm looking at my inbox. And it's just, yep, you know, yep. crazy how you get to meet people. And, and then I met another adjuster named Paolo Perez, who's also a new adjuster, but he does real estate investments. You meet all yep. kinds of people and exactly. fun stuff and you meet the people who are outgoing to, and they're looking to meet people. So yeah, always. That's right. And, um, you know, not only networking, but with the firms and the companies that sort of service our industry. But like you just said, networking with other adjusters, if especially early in a person's career, um, you're going to want to have as many uh, work opportunities as possible. Right. And yeah. a lot of the time when you, when somebody gets a call, they may start pinging their, their network and saying, you know, Paolo may say, Hey, Hey, Caleb, I just, you know, House and Company, they they uh, just called me and, and want me to go to, to Bismarck, North Dakota for some big hail they had up there. And they asked me if I knew anybody. Do you want to go up there and, and run a hail climb? Which me I would 100% yes. have had this exact conversation. Yeah. And I actually oh. was in a, not an interview, but just connecting with someone at a company the other day. And at the end of the call, he said, hey, do you know any other adjusters? You got any friends? Yeah. And I was yeah. like, first person, serve it up right there, because that, yep. I want to start getting those relationships going. Yeah, me and Paolo have this exact conversation. We're going to get a crew where when you get deployed, you tell people. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it, the firms will tell you, well, maybe they won't tell you. They've told me, but they, they probably won't tell everybody. Um, so I just will speak generally that there is a, uh, we're calling it a talent crisis right now because of, the same thing that's happening at, in the fast food industry, in the, every other possible industry where companies, there's 10 million jobs out there and nobody's taking them, right? Um, the same thing's happening at, in, at the, in the independent claims industry. Um, there are so many more opportunities right now. Anybody that's like, you know, with maybe some exceptions, anybody who's complaining that they're not able to get work or at least get started in something 
pointing and kind of getting in the direction of work right now is not trying hard enough because the jobs are there. They're 1000% there. And all the firms that I talk to, all the majors, they're like, listen, we're, we're, we're dying from, for more people as yeah. people, you know, in their fifties and sixties start to retire out. Right. Cause they, they got started when they were 45 and they did it for 10 years and they're like done with it. They want to go to do something else. They're retiring out They're They're leaving a void there. That's we want to try to fill up with younger folks. Um, I, when I started, I was 28 years old. Right. So, um, and that was, you know, a few years ago. Kind of talk about, you know, where you're from, how you heard about this, um, how many, you know, sort of like what kind of deployments or what sort of work you've done in the claims industry. And, uh, you know, just kind of give people an idea, like who you are. For sure. For sure. Um, I'll just rewind a week back to NACA and I can give you my two and a half minute elevator speech. Do it. <laughs> but basically, uh, my name's Caleb McClam. I'm from Pensacola, Florida, born and raised. I've lived in Pensacola, Colorado, specifically Denver and in Northern California. Uh, directly out of college where I did business management and a minor in mathematics, I started a sales career. I, I actually was hired as a valet on Craigslist and got lucky enough to interview with the CEO while he was on vacation. Take it a few years from there, I'm the Gulf Coast, or well, one year from there, I'm the Gulf Coast regional manager running multiple sites because he said I could be a regional manager, just go get more accounts. So I just walked my way into sales, finding more accounts for them. And then I was pretty good at it. So I walked my way into full-time sales with them for a second year with them. And I just saw kind of the next 10 years of my life shaping up of what it was going to be. And I just, I didn't like what I saw because for me, a sales career just wasn't fulfilling uh, to me in certain ways. And I didn't want to make it that way and just, you know, feel like I have a ball and chain for something I have no passion for. So I quit my job, traveled around the world for a year. Uh, wanted to become a pilot, nice. but I traveled to 12 countries, never became a pilot, spent all my money, best decision I ever made, and uh, came back and tried to start a farm in California, a lavender farm. COVID was not going to work with that, so had to drop it all and start all over again. And um, I basically found uh, an insurance adjuster at a bonfire talking about how much money they make. And so I've looked into it and I was like, man, that's real too. So I joined Chris Stanley's class. And while I was in his class, uh, he let me have the opportunity to go to Texas and do hail for auto. From there, I got Hague certifications. I took your class. I went to Pilots Field Catastrophe Claim College. I got 10 licenses total and got deployed as a desk adjuster from Pilot for Liberty Mutual Safeco for three months, handling CAT and non-CAT coded claims. That was until November of 2021. Uh, from there, I took the winter off, and because I'm not rich yet, I painted houses. I was a UPS driver helper, just doing whatever I can to make by, and I went to NACA. And at NACA, I interviewed with about 40 different companies and found a lot of good connections and lost my voice. Uh, by day three, my voice <laughs> was gone, gone. Right. But uh, I made connections and I'm starting to develop relationships, trying to work my way into catastrophic work because my my goal in my fantasy world is to have six months of cat work and then six months to myself to run my own businesses. I've always been entrepreneurial and I definitely see um, having my own businesses in my future in addition to McClam Independent Adjusting Services LLC, which is my current LLC. And uh, I want to do some real estate. I want to, you know, genuinely, I, I want to start creating generational wealth for my family and just want to see what we can do. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Caleb, I really appreciate you jumping on this um, free coaching call in exchange for letting me put it on the, on the Adjuster TV. Um, I think people are going to get a lot of value out of this. So thanks. Thanks again, man. It. And uh, I, I got one thing for you. I'm 29, so I got to get a selfie. All right. Yeah, because I'm on a Jessica TV. There we go. <laughs> All right, man. Right on, dude. Well, thanks again. You've got my email address. So if you got any questions or anything, definitely hit me up. I might. I might hit you up. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. Well, best of luck to you and we'll uh, we'll catch up with you later, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time. This is Adjuster TV.